The Psalms are a well-worn collection of songs, hymns, and prayers that speak to the human experience. Life is not a level path. In this world, we will experience joy, sorrow, anger, shame, love, jealousy, hope, and more. Emotions are a gift and a part of our God-given design. But how do we direct these emotions and keep our eyes fixed on God in the highs and lows of life? King David authored many psalms, and we will learn how to steward our lives well in the highest highs and the lowest lows as we study through some of his greatest hits. This morning, welcome. It's great to have you guys here. We're continuing our study through the psalms. Uh, we're calling it a summer mixtape looking at some of David's greatest hits. And so this morning, you can turn to Psalm 37. Sure, That's sure, where we'll sure. be this morning. Last week, uh, if you were with us, we looked at a different psalm. Uh, and specifically within that psalm, we looked at this idea of it being a, a fist of faith, sure. these five different sure. things that, that faith does when under attack, um, ways that it fights back the spiritual battle that is going on, and one of those was that faith is silent, another that faith waits. We looked at how faith stands still even when it wants to run away, that faith has no backup plan, there's no plan B, and that faith trusts, it rests in God's control. Well, this morning we're at one of my own personal favorite psalms, sure. Psalm, psalm 37. It's sure. another psalm of David, but it's one that I'm sure many of you know quite a few of the verses from, verses that we hold on to with these promises from God, verses that speak to um, countless questions we've asked time and time again throughout our lives. Um, and so if you're taking notes and you want to write down a title, you can write this down this morning, The Test of Time. The Test of Time. That's what we'll really be looking at throughout the entirety of Psalm 37. What do I mean when I talk about the test of time? You've heard the, the phrase before, right? When someone says that something has withstood the test of time, right? Speaking to the, the durability of that object, or maybe that, that this thing throughout the years has continued to remain important. It hasn't lost focus or hasn't lost its usefulness in your life. No matter the seasons that change and the wear and tear that might take place, this thing has withstood the test of of time. And I begin to think about in our lives, what are some objects, what are some things we've used before that we see standing the test of time? Here's one maybe some of you are familiar with. If we could pull up that first image there, a good old crock pot, right? I'm pretty sure my mom has used the same crock pot for the last 40 years, and it looks almost identical to that. Just just a well-made piece of machinery that does its job well. Now, maybe you've got a new one. I, I bet it wasn't because this one broke. I bet it was just because you wanted something maybe a little bigger or you wanted two of them. But, man, something that has stood the test of time. How about when it comes to children's, children's toys? Something like this, right? Lincoln Logs. I, my parents still have the same Lincoln Logs I grew up with that my kids play with when we go there. Right? They're not those kind of toys that you use once and it breaks and it's done forever. I mean, just a good old-fashioned piece of wood in the right shape so you can build with it. Now, how many of you, be honest this morning, you're in church, like me, just realized this week that it is actually Lincoln Logs and not Link and Logs? Because that was me. That was me, true story, this week. I have called them Link and Logs my entire life. This morning... I realized, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Sam team. This morning I realized for the first time that it is actually Lincoln Logs. And that's because the man who created these tiny little pieces of wood for a toy for your children originally designed them to be able to build a cabin and it was based off of Abraham Lincoln's cabin as a child. So there you go, a little history lesson for you, a fun fact about Lincoln Logs, but they're built to last. They last. They're, they've withstood the test of time. How about when it comes to cell phones? Oh, the good old Nokia, right? 
Everybody's seen one. I'm pretty sure you could go to Goodwill right now and pick this phone up, plug it in, and it would work for you. It is just a well-made phone that has withstood the test of time. And then the last great American meal. If we could go to that final one, there it is. And you want to talk about something that can withstand the test of time. It doesn't matter if you have it today or 20 years from now. You open that can and it's ready to eat. Good old spam. Maybe that one's open to interpretation. I don't know. But, but things that have just lasted year after year and wear and tear after wear and tear. And they've gone through many different owners and many different locations. And they just continue to work and to thrive. But then I begin to think about the opposite of this. What are some things that just cannot last at all? I mean, we continue to buy a new one every week because they continue to break. Well, here's a toy I'm sure many of you grew up with. Oh, those good old paddle balls, right? Maybe you get 20 swings in before that string goes flying and you're continuing to tie knots until your string gets so short you can't do it anymore. What about this childhood toy, the sticky hand? I'm grateful it's only a quarter because you get about 25 seconds of play with this before it's too dirty to even stick to anything. The sticky hand. Now we looked at a durable phone, but what's the reality about everybody's smartphone nowadays, right? If you're on a phone call and you just sneeze too hard, that screen will break on you. It does not last. And I hope I don't offend anybody, but we've all had furniture from here in our home. And we know what we're getting when we buy it, right? It will look nice, but if we ever have to move it or put any real weight on it or transport it, we're probably not getting there with all the legs intact. We know what we're getting when we buy from IKEA. You know, there was a wise quote by Benjamin Franklin that summarized this well. He said, the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of a low price is forgotten. That bitterness, it remains long after the sweetness of that low price is forgotten. As you continue to have to repair or replace the things that didn't last. Well, what does this have to do with Psalm 37? Today, David is going to introduce to us, or demonstrate rather, this same idea through the lens of our lives. That there are some lives that may seem flashy and exciting and, and new and thriving, and yet through the test of time, we see the deterioration and collapse that befalls them. They're the sticky hand or the Ikea coffee table that look beautiful when they first come in, and yet... Through seasons of life, through a little wear and tear, you begin to see them fall apart, no longer the same. But he's also going to show in Psalm 37 that there is a life in Christ, a life of quality, abundance, peace, hope, security, that will stand the test of time and will prove to only get better with time. It's a life that will stand the test of time, not only in this life, but in the one that is to come. Psalm 37 is interesting because it's unique in that most of the psalms we look at and we read through is, is David's prayers to the Lord. It's a cry out to God in times of trouble, and yet Psalm 37 is not directed at God. It's directed at us. It's directed at those listeners, those readers that would come across this psalm. He's instructing them and reminding them that, that no matter what things may seem like right now, remember the end game and remember what's coming for those in God and those outside of God, and then calls an action in light of that perspective. This psalm is an acrostic psalm, and what that means is that when it was originally written in Hebrew, they would have written the letters of their alphabet, all 22 of them, on the side, and it would have been helpful um, to pair up with the different lines because it would help people memorize it. So each word in the new set of verses would start with that next letter in their alphabet. And so it was this way that they could memorize the entire psalm and recite it. This was not a psalm to, to quickly read and forget. This was something to be memorized and thought about and pondered throughout one's life. And David's writing, as we always see him do in a time of trouble, 
not knowing exactly what that trouble was in his life, but what we do know, because he tells us in verse 25, is that he's writing at an old age. He's writing having gone through his life and now reflecting back on it, wanting to write some words of wisdom. Many people believe because his son Solomon is about to step in and take over as king. And he wants to hand down words of wisdom that his son can build a kingdom upon, that his son can build his life around. And so he pens this 37th Psalm. Before we go into any more detail about it, why don't we just jump in and read it together, beginning in verse 1. Here's what it says. Do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish. And to smoke, they shall vanish away. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, and those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young and am now old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore, for the Lord loves justice and he does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off. You shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree, yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the blameless man. And observe the upright, 
for the future of that man is peace. But the transgression, transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Let's pray as we begin. Lord, as we open this 37th Psalm this morning, as we look at these words of David, God, we pray that you would open our hearts to receive the word. Lord, our different opinions, our different perspectives, our different backgrounds and experiences, Lord, we come before your word to lay all those down because your word is our authority. God, we pray that we would glean not only understanding of how to live, but a greater understanding of of what you've done and accomplished for us through Christ. May this psalm draw us to a place of gratitude and praise that we would truly be a people who delight themselves in the Lord for your glory and your honor. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, as we look at this psalm, there's really one specific question that David is speaking to. It's a question that's been asked for thousands of years, and we could summarize it simply like this. Why is it that good people perish and bad people prosper? It's been asked different ways, like why do bad things happen to good people? And why does it seem like those who are doing bad continue to be spared and succeed and get away with it? Well, David's going to really speak to that question, that struggle, that tension within this psalm as we look at not only this moment, but the long game of eternity and what awaits those who do such things. Charles Spurgeon, when he spoke of the 37th Psalm, he said it was the great riddle of the prosperity of the wicked and the affliction of the righteous. And as we kind of dive into this Psalm today, we're going to dive into it a little bit differently than we might normally approach a chapter of Scripture. Normally, we just jump right in at verse 1 and walk our way through. But what David really does in this chapter is these first eight verses, he's really calling the the believer to action. He's telling them to to trust in the Lord, to delight in the Lord, to rest in the Lord. And, And we'll look at all of those actions. But he's calling those actions to the believer in light of the whole rest of the context of this chapter, where he's looked at what the future holds for those in Christ and what the future holds for those outside of Christ. Of no matter what it looks like now, what awaits all of us, depending on who we follow, who we are surrendered to. And so what we want to do this morning is first, we're going to take, take more of a 30,000 foot level view over the entirety of this chapter, the future that awaits those in Christ and those outside, and then come back and really camp at these first eight verses and look at the response we are to have in light of that. And so first we look at this, this future that he speaks to. He speaks to it constantly throughout this chapter. And first, he speaks to those who are outside of God, those who are enemies of God, those who are not seeking to follow the Lord, and 11 different verses within this chapter. And 17 times within those 11 verses, he speaks to the future of those outside of God. He begins by saying that the workers of iniquity in verse 2 shall soon be cut down. They will wither as the green herb. In verse 9, he says that evildoers shall be cut off. In verse 10, he says the wicked shall be no more. In verse 15, he says their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. In verse 17, he says the arms of the wicked shall be broken. 
In verse 20, he says, the wicked shall perish. They shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. Verse 22, those cursed by him shall be cut off. Verse 28, the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. Verse 34, the wicked are cut off. Verse 36, he passed away, and behold, he was no more. And verse 38, the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. Can he be any more clear throughout the entirety of this chapter what awaits the wicked, those outside of God? They will be cut off, and again, they will be cut off. They will be no more. They will vanish away, and their descendants will be cut off, and they will be cut down like the grass. Again and again and again, David is saying their end is coming. There may be a day that they are prospering. There may be a day that they are rising up. There may, may be a day that they are in good standing, but all of that is coming to an end. That their time is running out. And no matter what you see right now, David is saying, I've lived a long life, and I've seen men rise up in power, and I've seen them come to their end. One of those examples David was very close to, King Saul for a large portion of his life and most of these psalms that he writes. He saw Saul come into power. He saw him rise up, and he saw throughout his life, no matter how many times it seemed like David was going to lose his life, God protected him. And no matter how much it seemed like Saul was in control, David now, coming to the end of his life, can say, no, there was a time when he was going to be cut off, and it had been prophesied, and it had been guaranteed, and I saw it come about. And this isn't just like they go from a place of, of high authority and power to a lower place. He says, you look for them and you can't even find them. They've been wiped out, removed, gone altogether. It's the future of those outside of God. But then he also reflects upon those in Christ. Those who, like David, have chosen to follow the Lord with all their heart for allowing his word to be a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path. And what does he say the future is that awaits those in God? Well, he has 18 different verses in this chapter, and within those verses, 28 different times that he mentions the future of those in God. In verse 9, and this is one of his common phrases he uses in this chapter, he says, those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. There's an inheritance that awaits them. In verse 11, the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Verse 17, the Lord upholds the righteous. Verse 18, their inheritance shall be forever. Verse 19, they shall not be ashamed in the evil time. In the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. Verse 22, those blessed by him shall inherit the earth. Verse 24, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Verse 25, they shall not be forsaken or found begging for bread. Verse 26, their descendants are blessed. See this in contrast to those outside of God whose descendants are cut off. No, those in God, their descendants are blessed. Blessed. Verse 27, they shall dwell forevermore. Verse 28, they are not forsaken by the Lord, but are preserved forever. Verse 29, shall inherit the land and dwell in it. Verse 31, none of his steps shall slip or slide. Verse 33, the Lord will not leave him in the wicked one's hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Verse 34, he shall exalt you to inherit the land. You shall see the wicked cut off. Verse 37, the future of that man is peace. Verse 39, he is their strength in times of trouble. And verse 40, the Lord shall help him and deliver him. He shall deliver him from the wicked and save him. Once again, can David be any more clear throughout the entirety of this chapter to say the future of those in God 
in contrast with the future of those outside of God, is one of an inheritance, that there is something good coming for you, that you can look forward to, that you will receive. You look forward in the future with hope because your life is going to be marked by peace and the Lord is never going to forsake you and he's going to be your strength in difficult times and no matter what awaits you, no matter when you fall, you won't slip. You will get back up because God is going to be your strength and your salvation. And time and time again, David says, I look back at my life and there were seasons where he faced giants he faced enemies where he was outnumbered. He was hiding in caves. He was on the run. He was hungry looking for bread. But he says in all of it, God provided. God was faithful. God took care of me. And he says, and the same is true for anyone else who find themselves in God today. No matter what the future holds, here's some things you can hold on to. That God is faithful. And that your future in Christ is bright doesn't mean it will be easy. He mentions in here that there are wicked that are gnashing their teeth, that are plotting schemes against you. But when they come with the sword, they pierce their own heart. And when they come with the bow, it's going to break because the Lord fights for you. And David wants to remind anyone who would read this psalm throughout their lives of what their future is in God. And that a life in Christ can withstand the test of time. And he calls this group that are in Christ to a response. He not only speaks to their future, but he speaks to what their actions should be in light of that future throughout the chapter. He'll begin in verse 1 and we'll dig in in a moment, but he says, do not fret. In fact, he says it three times in this chapter. Do not fret, do not fret, do not fret. He says, don't be envious, don't envy them. Remember their end and remember your future. Do not envy them. He says to trust in the Lord and do good. To dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. To delight yourself in the Lord to commit your way to the Lord and trust also in Him, to rest in the Lord, to cease from anger and forsake wrath, to wait on the Lord, to show mercy and give freely, to depart from evil and do good, to speak wisdom and talk of justice, to keep the law of God in your heart, to wait on the Lord and keep his way, and to mark the blameless and observe the upright. He says, this is what should be filling the time of those who realize their future inheritance. It's a life that consists of trusting God and dwelling in his land and delighting yourself in him and doing good to others and, and extending mercy and, and giving freely. This is the life of the believer because they aren't scared of what the future holds or what they face today because God is in control. But the response, you might say, well, what is the response then that he's calling those against God to? Well, it's simple. In light of this chapter, anybody who's outside of God, anybody who's walking in that wickedness and is not under God's protection, the response is simple. You either repent and you receive the mercy of God, and you experience that inheritance that could be yours, or if you continue to reject it, you will face the judgment of God. That end that David is describing is yours. And it's in light of this understanding that as we look at the long game of the entirety of our lives and what awaits us, and these are the two futures that are before each and every person that has ever lived, that he then really dives in to these first eight verses and starts with verse one to say, do not fret because of evildoers. Do not fret because of evildoers. What does it mean to, to fret? Well, literally, if you were to translate the word that's used there in Hebrew, it means don't get heated. And I like that. Don't get heated. Don't get all angry and furious and, and boiled up inside and, 
We might say, don't get worked up. Don't get so hot and bothered. Don't blow up because of what the evil workers are doing. And you might say, why? Why would I not get upset about that? Well, he tells you, because they soon shall be cut down like the grass. We're reminded in Scripture that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And here he says, don't get all hot and bothered because of evil workers. Realize their end is coming. They're soon going to be cut down like grass. God's going to go mow the lawn. So you don't have to fret. You don't have to worry about it. There's coming an end where he's going to cut it off. He's going to cause it to cease. So don't fret. He's going to say that phrase two more times. And when you see him repeat something three times, we should probably get it. And it also means we probably struggle with it. Can we be honest as the church today and admit we far too easily and far too often fret, get heated, get angry and, and bothered and, and frustrated and boil over and blow up because of what evil people are doing, because of what wicked people are doing. In verse 7, he tells us not to fret because of him who prospers in his way. For once again, evildoers shall be cut off. And then he summarizes all three of them in his final one, in verse 8, when he says, Don't fret, because it only causes harm. It only causes harm. What are we actually accomplishing when we get heated and angry and boil over and blow up? The only thing you're accomplishing is more harm. It's doing more harm than good. Not only to ourselves, to our mind, to our soul, to our body, as we continue to get bitter inside and, and mumble and complain, and all it takes is one more thing on the news or one more post online or one more comment from someone at the store, and boom, we're blowing up again, and we're angry, and we're that person that's walking through the aisle, and we're talking to ourselves, and he says, don't fret because of the evildoers. You're only doing harm. You know, fretting is, is what I like to think of as the other leg on the rocking chair of worrying. It's been said that worry, and, and I like to throw fretting in there as well, is like a rocking chair, right? It gives you something to do, but you don't get anywhere. That's what worrying does. That's what fretting does. It's not going to get you anywhere. It's not going to stop them from doing evil. It's not going to give you a better day, and it's not going to bring joy or encouragement to anybody around you. We all know those people, and you're like, oh, no, you started it. You've got them heated, they're boiling over, and now we're just going to all have to sit here and receive all their frustration for the week. He said it only causes harm. Don't fret because of them. God's going to work that out. God sees what's going on, and if it makes you angry, just think about how angry it makes the Lord. Oh, and he's going to deal with it. And not with an angry post online and not with a rant to your friends and family. No, he's going to actually bring justice to it and accomplish what needs to be accomplished there. So he says, do not fret. But what should you do? Well, you shouldn't be envious of them. Don't be envious of those people. Remember their end. You don't want anything to do with that future. But what you should do as he says in verse 3, is trust in the Lord and do good. Is to dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Is to delight yourself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's to rest in the Lord in verse 7. And it's to cease from anger in verse 8. Instead of getting heated over evildoers and, and what they're causing to happen in our world today, we trust in the Lord. We trust in His control. We trust in His plan. We trust in His sovereignty over this situation. And then what do we do as we are trusting in the Lord? You don't just sit there. You trust in Him. And in your actions, you demonstrate that trust in Him by doing 
good. Lord, I trust you're going to deal with that. You see what's going on there. You will bring justice to that. I myself, am I, I'm going to be faithful to do good. I'm not going to follow in their footsteps. I'm not going to allow comparison or frustration in this moment rob me of my joy. No, I'm going to trust you, God, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to do good. They might be a force for evil. Lord, use me as a force for good. It's what Paul summarizes in Romans 12, 21, when he says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's what David's saying here. Don't, don't fret. Don't be envious. Don't be overcome by all of the evil in the world. Trust in the Lord and overcome the evil with good. You know, I remember a very convicting moment I had with the Lord. When I was working for the city of Fortuna, uh, back before I moved to Auburn, and, and I remember thinking one day and talking with one of my coworkers who was also a believer, and I said, man, these, these guys who don't know the Lord, they are unashamed of what they stand for. I mean, things that are shameful, things that people shouldn't be boasting about and shouldn't even feel comfortable talking about, and, and they are just open as can be about it, and they are, they are living that out to the fullest, let me tell you. It's no question what they believe. It's no question what they're living for, and everything they do is in light of it. And the conviction I felt was, why is it that we're so frustrated at how they're living but they're, they're fully living with what they believe, and yet here we are, not fully living out what we believe at work. That are just kind of remaining silent and frustrated at their conversations, and can you stop talking about that, and I can't believe you do that, and instead of like we're instructed to do here, trusting in the Lord and doing good, overcoming that evil with good, actually fully living out what we believe and allowing it to consume our conversations and our actions. I was reading a book this week. Um, it's an older book, and, and I was a little skeptical at the title, but someone promised me it was going to be good, and it was. It's called The Christian Secret of a Happy Life, right? Instantly, you're, you're skeptical, right? I was too. I'm like, I don't want to read this. But as I was reading it, I was reading this chapter about our, our service to the Lord, this doing good that we're talking about this morning. And here's what, what the book said. Listen to this. What is needed for happy and an effectual service is simply to put your work into the hands of the Lord and leave it there. Do not take it to him in prayer and then rise from your knees and take the burden all back and try and guide and arrange it for yourself Leave it with the Lord and remember that what you trust to him, you must not worry over or feel anxious about. Trust and worry do not go together. If, you wor if your work is a burden, it is because you are not trusting it to him. But if you do trust it to him, you will surely find that the yoke he puts on you is easy and the burden he gives you to carry is light. And even in the midst of a life of ceaseless activity, you will find rest for your soul. I love that. The trust and worry, we could say this morning, trust and fretting, they do not go together. That if you entrust it to the Lord, you let go of it. You allow him to deal with it. And that you do your work from that place that is easy and is light, where your soul can find rest in the Lord. David, David tells us what the life of the believer looks like as we trust in the Lord when he says here that you will dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. That's what this trust in action looks like. It's dwelling in the land the Lord has provided for us to reside in, to live in the space that God has provided for us in our homes, in our cities, in this country and the beautiful creation around us. In the beginning, God created a garden for Adam and Eve to dwell in with him, to live in and experience all the goodness of everything he had made. But sin, it caused them to be cast out of that garden. 
The children of Israel would then find themselves one day in bondage in Egypt. But what does the Lord do? He brings freedom for his people, and he brings them to a promised land that they can dwell in once again and feed on the faithfulness of God. And here, David wants to remind us, as a free people in the Lord, in the protection and care of God, that we can dwell at peace on the earth in him. It's what Psalm 4, verse 8 speaks to when it says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. To dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness, our good shepherd, he protects us from the enemy, as we saw in Psalm 23. And we can dwell and lie down in green pastures by still waters. We can go through the valley of the shadow of death and not fear any evil because he's with us. And his rod and his staff, they comfort us. He says you dwell in the land. You don't, you're not on the run. You're not taken captive by the enemy. You can dwell in freedom in the land God has provided for you and feed on his faithfulness. Just as your physical body needs to be fed daily to sustain it, to strengthen it. David invites us to feed on the faithfulness of God to sustain us and strengthen us spiritually so that as we rise in the morning, no matter what guilt or shame tries to meet us, now I'm feeding on the promise that God's mercy is new every morning, that he has cast my sin as far as the east is from the west, and where sin abounds, grace abounds so much more. We feed on his faithfulness. When we begin to be overwhelmed with feelings of loneliness and anxiety, we find comfort and peace in the reality that when we have put our faith in Jesus, he is a God who never leaves us or forsakes us. And when we take those thoughts captive, he promises that, that it is the peace of God that will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And we feed on that promise. David, at the end of his life, can conclude that what has sustained him throughout the entirety of his life is not his own cunningness, it's not his own strength or experience, it's not the army around him, it was God and his faithfulness to protect David, to provide for David, to forgive David when David fell into sin. He is feeding on the faithfulness of God in his life. It's what he says later on when he says, Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. He speaks of the fall of the wicked and says that it's their end. When they fall, they are destroyed. They're like a vapor and they vanish away. But when, when the righteous, when those in God fall down, he says, You won't be utterly cast down. He will pick you back up. Your foot won't slip because the Lord upholds him with his hand. He says, I have been young and I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Now the Lord is faithful. Feed on his faithfulness. And David says, through all my life, I have never seen someone depend on the Lord and be let down. And so as we trust in the Lord, as we dwell in the land and we feed on his faithfulness, he then says in verse 4, delight yourselves also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. To delight means to affect with great pleasure. It's to, to charm, to captivate. I love that. Be captivated by the Lord. Allow his presence, his character, his work in your life to affect you with great pleasure and joy. Let me ask you this morning, are you captivated by the Lord? When you read about his faithfulness, when you hear about what he's accomplished for you and your inheritance in him, are you captivated by that? Do you just delight as you read this psalm and read of all the future that awaits you in Jesus? Does it bring delight and peace to your heart? Does he just amaze you with his love for you, his grace towards you day after day, his care and protection in your life? 
that even though he is the God that is so great and vast that he's created all the stars in the sky, he's the God who's so intimate and personal that he knows you by name and he thinks about you. Does that just bring delight to your heart? We can get so caught up in the second part of this verse. The, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And so what do we do? Well, I've got a lot of desires in my heart, so what do I need to do to accomplish those? I need to delight myself in the Lord. Okay, so how do I do that so I can get that? And the delight is just a means to an end. But what does this truly look like? What is David really saying here? Well, I believe we read a part about this delight and what it looks like all the way back in the, the first psalm written, Psalm 1, when it speaks about this man who is blessed. And it says, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And what does that look like? It says, he meditates on it day and night. And to delight in the Lord, he is just filling your mind day and night. You just think upon his goodness. You can't go outside without gazing at the sun and just being thankful for the warmth that it brings and the detail of creation around us and God's care and thoughtfulness and his listening ear that is always there for us as his dear children. It looks like constantly thinking about and contemplating, pondering who God is, all that he has done. And that's a piece of this delighting that David is speaking to here. I think it speaks to when you go to a place like the Grand Canyon or the beautiful redwoods, or you go out somewhere where there's no lights around you and you gaze upon the stars above you in the sky. There is an awe in that moment. There is an amazement and a wonder as you just sit and behold something so much bigger than you and enjoy just being in the presence of it. I can think of times I've had these moments and, and I'm not filled with an amount of words and, and statements. I'm just sitting there in silence, just amazed. Just delighting, just beholding what's before you. David says, man, delight in the Lord like that. Just sit and think upon how great he is, how beautiful he is, how vast he is, and just sit in that silence in awe of our God. That is what it's like to delight yourself in the Lord. But here's the reality this morning. You cannot delight in what you do not know. You will never appreciate and delight in God rightly until you know him correctly. You'll never delight yourself in the Grand Canyon like you will when you sit there in its presence and you look upon it in all its glory and you behold it. Someone could tell you about it, and you might appreciate it. That's not the same as delighting in it. You might say, well, that sounds pretty cool. Maybe one day I'll go there. That's, uh, that's really good for you. I'm glad that you delighted in that. But to really delight yourself in the Lord, you have to know him. And when you know him, and when you've experienced him, when you've sat in his presence you understand what it means to fully delight yourself in the Lord. And just like there's no substitute for the Grand Canyon, there is no substitute for the redwoods or the stars above us or fill in the blank, even more so, there is no substitute for the creator of all those things. And there is no place where we can delight and experience what we were truly made for more than in the presence of God. There is no sight worth comparing when you see God at work in your life and when you felt his presence. And there is no greater sense of awe or amazement that you will ever feel than when you truly comprehend that you have been fearfully and wonderfully made by a God that loves you so intimately and so completely that he would go through the agony of the cross just to make a way for you to come home with him for eternity. You want to know how God can give you all the desires of your heart by causing you to delight in him. The greatest desire of your heart truly is to worship, admire, and praise. 
And God gives you that desire by revealing himself to you and drawing you to delight in him. And so this is not a do this and get that. These two are linked together. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he is giving you the desires of your heart. And David, at the end of his life, can still say, man, delight yourself in the Lord and let me tell you, every desire your heart has ever truly had that's really been in there, it is all satisfied in him. Everything else is just a sad substitute to try and fill the void that only delighting in the Lord can fill. And then he says in verse 5, as we delight ourselves in the Lord and he's giving us the desire of our heart, we are to commit our ways to him. To commit literally means to roll on to. That's what it means to commit to him. It's not to give it a try. It's not to kind of put a little weight in this thing over here. It's to fully be all in and just roll on to it. To roll all of your problems on the Lord. To roll all of your worries on the Lord. To roll all of your fears, all of your decisions, all of your frustrations, all of your cares onto him. As you delight in him, as you trust in him, as you dwell on the land and you feed on his faithfulness, just roll it all onto him. And he shall bring it to pass. I can't help but when I read that phrase, he shall bring it to pass. I, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. I don't know if any of you are, but immediately I think of Gandalf, right? And he slams down that staff and he says, you shall not pass. And that Balrog is not going to pass. But here when we read David say, and he shall bring it to pass. You better believe when, when David says, God's going to bring it to pass, he is going to bring it to pass. You can take that to the bank. And he says, those worries, those fears, those decisions, just give all those to the Lord and he'll bring it to pass. This goes back to that idea, you can't trust and worry. If you're going to roll it on to the Lord, if you're going to lay it all down before him, then you need to let go and trust that he's going to bring it to pass that he has a plan that is so much bigger than ours, and he's in full control, and so that trust says, God, I don't know how this is going to turn out. And maybe it's not going to work out the way I'm praying, the way I'm hoping, but I'm still trusting that your ways are better. Your ways are greater, and you see so much more than I do. And so I commit it to you, and I trust you with it. You're going to bring it to pass. Why? Well, because as 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7 says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. There it is, committing it all, rolling it on to him, for he cares for you. See, you're not going to fully trust in the Lord and you're not going to fully commit and roll everything onto him if you don't believe that he cares for you. But when you know that you serve a God that cares deeply for you, that loves you more than you'll ever know, and is intimately involved in your life, you can cast it all upon him. And you can leave it there because you, I know you care for me, God. I know you have my best interests in mind, God. I know you love me. You're a heavenly father. And so as a child, I'm just, I'm giving it up to you, Dad. I trust you're going to take care of me. I trust you've got a plan here. And so I cast it all to him. And when we do that, verse 6 tells us and promises us that he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. That just as completely as the light comes every day and just as surely as you are guaranteed it's coming, that he will bring it to pass. He will do it. He will accomplish it. And so what can we do then? In verse 7 it tells you you can rest. You can rest. Just delight in the Lord. Just dwell in the land. And rest in his finished work. Some of you need to hear that this morning. You have been striving. You have been running. You have been fighting. You have been worrying. You've been fretting. And God is telling you, I've got it. Cast it on me. Commit it to me and then rest. 
There is a rest for your souls when you take on his yoke that is easy, his burden that is light. The work is so completely and entirely done by him. The only thing that you're given to do is rest. But what can I do? Give me a job, God. I want to be helpful. Just rest. Shh, 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 just, just stop. Just stop. All your fretting, it's only doing harm. Just rest. Just trust that I'm in control and I'm working it out. That rest, it's an active demonstration of your trust. That resting that might feel like I'm doing nothing. No, you are. You're actively living by faith because it takes faith to rest in God. And to say, I'm not going to try and do it, Lord. I'm going to trust you with it. I'm going to rest. I'm going to wait. It's an act of faith. And likewise, the opposite. Restlessness is actually a sign of our unbelief and our lack of trust. What does Psalm 127.2 tell us? It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. You can rest in the Lord. It is vain. Our text says it is only harm for you to fret, for you to worry, for you to toil, for you to burn the candle at both ends because I've got to get this done, and if I don't do it, it won't be accomplished, then maybe it shouldn't be done. We rest in the fact that God has given us what we need to do, and we can do it in the time he's given us. And if I can't accomplish it in the time I have, maybe I'm taking on more than I should. But I'm going to rest in the Lord because he gives his beloved sleep. And then I will wait patiently while I rest in him. This is that silent, standing still by faith we looked at last week. We all know the great American prayer, right? Lord, give me patience and give me it now. That's what we all want. But David reminds us, no, you need to wait. You need to rest. You need to be still. Just delight yourself in the Lord. And you'll find rest. You'll find peace the desires of your heart, they will be met. And the future that awaits you in Christ, it is an inheritance. It is something to hope for. It is something to look forward to with great anticipation and excitement. You know, this psalm has been coined before as the parachute psalm. The parachute psalm. And the reason why is because that word parachute, it's a French word, and it's two words put together. The word para, which means protection against or defense against, and the word shoot, which means a fall. So a parachute is a defense, a protection against a fall. If you're planning to jump out of a plane anytime soon, you're going to want a defense against that fall. You're going to want protection. And that's what that parachute provides. Well, this psalm of David is written for our protection, our defense against a fall. David's trying to warn us at the end of his life, hey, learn from this while you're still young. And base your life upon the promises of this psalm, and it will be a protection, it will be a defense. Like jumping out of that plane... You are heading towards the ground, and there will come an end. But when you allow the parachute of this psalm to protect you against that fall and to slow down that fall, you will land in peace. In fact, you will find great delight as you float towards the ground and enjoy and delight in all that God has for you. But David's not going to put the parachute on you. He's going to hand it to you, and every one of us, our life has has already begun. We're outside of the plane. Whether we liked it or not, maybe we're kicking and screaming through life, but we are heading towards the ground. Are you wearing the parachute? Do you have that protection, that defense against the fall? David's hope is that you do. 
And David, as I invite the worship team back up this morning, is speaking to a reality that is true in this psalm for every one of us every day of our lives here on earth. And here it is. If you are saved this morning, if you've given your life to Jesus, if you've been forgiven of your sins, then this life is the closest you will ever be to hell and the farthest you will ever be from heaven. Do you realize that? This life you are currently living, if you are saved, this is the closest you'll ever get to hell. This is as bad as it could ever get. And this is the farthest you'll ever be from heaven. It's only going to get closer. It's only going to get better. And you think it's good now? You think you can delight yourself in the Lord now in a fallen world with sin? Just wait till you see all that God has in store for you in Him. You haven't even scraped the surface of the fullness of joy and the pleasures forevermore that are found in His presence. We cannot even fathom, we can't even think or imagine what that will be like. And the sufferings of this present world, they're not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us one day. But if you're not a Christian this morning, you have not given your life to Jesus, you have not confessed or repented of your sins, I'm here to tell you this morning with a heavy heart that you better enjoy what you've got right now because this short life is the closest you'll ever be to heaven and the farthest you'll ever be from hell. That means this is the best it will ever be if you're outside of God. And your future will only get worse. Your end is coming. Destruction awaits you. And you have not even scraped the surface of what it means to suffer, to face rejection, and to live with regret or sorrow with what you will experience when one day you stand before a holy and righteous God with no payment for your sins and all of your good works only equaling filthy rags. And as you depart from him as a wicked one who has never known him, you will experience a regret and sorrow that you cannot even fathom. And you might say, Lucas, it's not very kind to talk about, but I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to tell you the truth. And the gospel, it calls you to a decision. And every one of us, our future is headed towards one of those realities. And both of those fates, they're sealed here in mortality, but they are experienced for eternity. And the decision you make in this life, you will live for eternity with. All those present here today, all those listening online, all those who ever hear this as a recording, I urge you, I plead with you, and I beg you, don't wait to seal your fate. Don't put off for tomorrow what you need to do today. Now is the day of salvation, and there will never be a better time to give your life to Jesus and to be sure of your future than there is right now. And you do not want to base where you'll spend eternity on whether or not you'll have tomorrow. You've been given today, and that's a gift. The very breath in your lungs is a gift. Don't waste it. Redeem it in this moment. Cry out to Jesus today, and you can receive forgiveness. You can commit and roll all of your worries and fears, all of your sins and mistakes on him. You can trust in him today. You can find rest in him today. There is, ex there is forgiveness and delight and a family of God waiting for you on the other side of that decision, as well as a future and a hope and an inheritance in him. And in a moment, what could be accomplished is your story and your script completely flipping. And what you read about in the beginning of this service as your future destruction, you can now read about your future inheritance and hope in him.
And you say that's too good, and you say that's impossible, but I tell you, we serve a God who can do the impossible and who is so good that it's hard to fathom at times. That is his grace. That is his love for you today. And it doesn't require any more of your work. No, we feed on his faithfulness, not our own. But before we can take communion, before we can remember that finished work of Jesus, before we can celebrate what he's done for us, I need to ask, is there anyone here this morning that needs to first get right with the Lord? Because communion is something that is only for believers to partake in. We take in this remembering what he's done for us, that we've received that finished work of Jesus. But it's not for the unbeliever to take. Well, I want to give you an opportunity right now to make that decision. So is there anybody this morning that needs to raise their hand and needs to make the decision to give their life to Jesus? That needs to make that decision to turn from their sin and to give their life to the only one that can save them. The only parachute that can stop you from the fall that is coming. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is there anyone this morning that needs to raise their hand and make that decision? This morning we sit, I trust, among family. The people who look upon this psalm with great hope and anticipation because you know what your future holds in Christ. And it's at this time that we want to take communion together to remember what's been done for us, to remember what Jesus accomplished on the cross so that when we read Psalm 37 and the inheritance that awaits us, we can be confident in it. In Luke 22, Jesus was with his disciples and in beginning in verse 14, it says, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they begin to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. We take communion in remembrance of Jesus' body broken for us and his blood shed for us. And we take this to remember the new covenant in his blood that is shed for us because this new covenant couldn't be kept by us. We're unfaithful. We would break it. No, this covenant was kept by him. It's been sealed by God on both ends. Jesus coming and living the life we couldn't live And God from heaven reaching down and extending that justice, that wrath, and that mercy through Jesus on the cross so that this is a covenant we can enter into and don't have to worry about falling out of this covenant. This is a covenant that's sealed on both ends by God. And he says, just take this and remember that it was my body broken for you, that it was my blood shed for you, so that you can experience the goodness of that covenant, so you can enter into eternity with him, 
so that we can be welcomed one day as faithful servants because we feed on the faithfulness of Jesus who's gone before us. Let's take the bread together and remember his body broken for us. Lord, we take this bread remembering your sacrifice for us on the cross. That you freely gave your life for us and your body was broken and bruised, beaten and hung on a cross for our sins what we deserved. Lord, we remember it. Lord, we receive it. We believe it this morning. Let's take the cup now together in remembrance of his blood that was shed for us. And Lord, we take this cup Remembering your blood that was spilled because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. It was our blood that was owed, but we recognize that you so loved us that you sent your son to shed his own blood for us. And we recognize that blood does not only cover our sin, no, it washes us white as snow. It brings us into the family of God. It makes us co-heirs with Christ. It takes us from sinners and makes us saints. We receive your blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We believe it this morning that nothing can wash away our sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And the only thing that can make us whole again is the blood of Jesus. thank you for your sacrifice. We remember it this morning and we live our lives in light of it today. As forgiven people, as accepted people, as saved people. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. That is what we celebrate today, that our God reigns that he's victorious and that in Christ we are more than conquerors. As we go today, may you go with that mindset. The confidence that we looked at today, the reminder from David that even when you fall, he will pick you back up. that even in all of his life, the righteous were never forsaken. May you go in that perspective that no matter those who seem to prosper today, remember what the future holds and trust in the Lord and do good. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Rest in him. Commit your way to him. And may he be honored in the life we live by faith. Looking towards the future with hope because our best days are still ahead of us in Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you need prayer for anything this morning, if you're going through a season where you're wrestling to believe that, we have people that would love to pray for you this morning up here at the front. But may you go with that confidence that David reminds us of in Psalm 37 today. And we'll see you guys next week.